Words with Books is a podcast where two men talk to a book. Everyone listens to these two people get crazier and crazier until they have a psychotic break and kill their respective families. Words About Books is this podcast where we discuss and digest books in a book club-like atmosphere. I'm your pod host, Nate. Opposite me is Ben. How you doing, buddy? I almost stopped you because I <laughs> thought you were sincerely getting it wrong again. <laughs> but I'm glad we're not going to kill our families. Yeah, that would be uh, that'd be bad. That'd be a downer. Yeah, I'd be speaking of downers, <laughs> <laughs> this week we're going over the fold by Peter Klein, uh. <laughs> a, a once promising author. <laughs> yeah, we uh, we read fourteen, which was one of his other books, and that's why I actually picked this book. My friend got me into fourteen. And I read it, and I liked it. I got you into it. You seemed to like it. And then my friend read The Fold, and he recommended that I read that as well. And as we discuss the book more and more, I think less and less about it. Yeah, I really enjoyed 14. I won't give much away about 14, but it's kind of a a comedy mystery sci-fi book of these people who live in this strange apartment building and something something is very weird and almost like supernatural about the apartment building and they investigate it together and it's one of those books that actually does more with its concept it's not pure sci-fi it's not pure character comedy but the plot of the book kind of mirrors the character's personal growth in a really charming way and the characters come together and become a community of, of friends and neighbors and it's it's really just a charming book and it, it was f- genuinely funny i got kind of a, a scott pilgrim vibe from it. it that coming of age but you're kind of a late bloomer like you're already of age but you should uh figure life out now Right. He he ad- he even admits that he hasn't figured it out yet. He doesn't know what he's doing with his life. He's working a job he hates and doesn't really have any prospects. Yeah, 14 really worked for me. And I would say, actually, I know these books are supposed to be kind of independent of one another, though set in the same universe. Do you remember what the universe is called? The Threshold. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So they're, they're in the Threshold universe together. Um... They are independent, but I would definitely recommend reading 14 first. Absolutely. And and perhaps only. (laughs) Yeah. The way I was going to put it was read 14 first. And if you really feel like you need more, you can read the fold. But the best parts of the fold were done better in 14. If you really liked the last 100 pages of 14, if that was your favorite part of the book... You might like the fold. Spoiler alert, that is no one's favorite part of 14. Was not mine. I could see how it would be somebody's like, maybe if I were a little bit younger, I'd have been more into that. Yeah, let's let's talk about the fold. <laughs> I'm gonna real quick talk about the author, but I know we're gonna we're gonna have some things to say about him as the book goes on. First I was shocked when I was looking him up. Peter Kleins is fifty years old, and I'm not gonna lie, I was expecting a dude in like his late thirties. As all of his main characters are a dude in their late 30s. Apparently he wanted to be a writer at a young age. He wanted to work for Marvel Comics, which makes a lot of sense when you read his, his work. He has a lot of cultural references. He... <laughs> I was going to say, what do, you mean by, what do you mean by that? What do you think a writer for Marvel Comics is like? He, well, also, his first book was a superhero zombie apocalypse thing. That makes more sense now. Okay. He, he got an English degree in 1991. Went on to work as a props master in San Diego, and around 2006, he decided to go into writing full-time. He did a lot of Lovecraftian zombie short stories, which, again, 14, The Fold, makes a lot of sense. And his first work, like I said, was X Heroes, which was released in 2008. And on the front page of his website, it proudly talks about Paradox Bound, the five X series books, and this one, The Fold. So I, I don't know. I was guessing maybe The Fold had better reviews or was more financially successful than 14. But I definitely would have put 14 on there if I were him and like put The Fold somewhere else. Yeah, I wish we were reviewing 14. Or not reviewing, I guess. I wish we were talking about 14. 
there's something else that probably fits in the about the author section that I want to talk about a little bit. Okay. In the afterword to this book, Peter Kleins mentions that this was actually based on a short story that he'd written when he was in college for a creative writing class. And his professor apparently didn't like the short story very much. His, I think his exact words were, it didn't go over with the instructor's literary, quote unquote, tastes. And while I didn't agree with him on a lot of his points, it left me feeling bad enough about the story that I just filed it away. So we've got the threshold universe here, and I, I guess it's getting a little bit ahead of ourselves to talk about what really ties the threshold universe together. But it seems like there were a lot of ideas he was playing with as a student that sort of got refined and moved around and placed into different stories. And a lot of that went on to become 14. And then after 14 was published, he rediscovered this short story and realized oh, there's some similarities here. Maybe this could be like a, a side cool type book to 14. And the problem winds up being that so many of the things that I think were bouncing around in his head went into 14 that there wasn't much new left for the fold. That seems pretty accurate. When I was reading this, and again, I'm, I'm going a little bit towards final thoughts, but I just want to, I might as well get it out of the way up front. I didn't particularly like the book. I was initially let down because I had such high hopes for it based on 14. I was actually, not that I don't respect your choices, but I was relieved to find out it was by Peter Kleins, a guy who I knew I liked. <laughs> You briefly, sometimes... you briefly said that you thought Heir to the Empire was a superior book. I enjoyed it more. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'd go that far. <sighs> Heir to the Empire didn't leave me feeling quite as gross in places. Yeah, that's Timothy, a good word for it. I never got the vibe that Timothy Zahn might be kind of gross. <laughs> we'll just leave it there. We'll go into that here. Yeah, we'll get to that when we get to that, but... Yeah, you know, I, I kind of feel bad because uh, when I look back at the books we read, my two favorite books were both the ones that you picked. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? But no, I, I actually would have picked The Fold. Like, that is something I would have picked. I was, I was like, oh, Peter Kleins, that's the guy who wrote 14. I loved 14. And so I was really excited to read this. And I just remember thinking, like, man, 50 pages in, I was like, what a giant step backwards. <laughs> <laughs> for an author it just in every like it's, it's just so much less mature in a bad way not not in like a fun comedic we're, we're going on like a high school adventure kind of way like this, bruce this campbell just, not like that no like exactly like bruce campbell was just pure farce and it was juvenile humor and i don't i don't hate that this was immature in the sense of like a 16 year old who thinks he's mature writing things that just reflect a total lack of like awareness and when i i heard it was based on a short story he wrote in college i was like yeah that actually it, it was literally a step backward he literally looked backward for the material and i don't know how much of the original short story is included in this book it's a 370 page book so probably not a lot but it just it had so many strange so many strange problems that he he had grown past as an author by this point and it, i almost wonder like how quickly did he turn this out how much effort did he put into adapting it from the original material these are mysteries we'll we'll never know the answer to so let's dive into the summary all right i want to start because i'm gonna contrast all that negative stuff you said i'm gonna contrast that and also the previous book's opening with this book's opening so we read now, when you say the okay i was gonna say we read head full of ghosts prior to the fold and head full of ghosts opens with a god-awful blog post as the second chapter and the first chapter is terrible cringy i thought it was gonna be the the trope of the amazing godly writer like stephen king this story opens with a bit of tension it's a nice hook so there's a woman named becky she's talking on the phone with her friend she's killing time waiting for her husband ben to come home ben is in charge of some high security projects that usually involve weapons so that's the setup she's 
cleaning up around the house and doesn't want her husband to see what a slob she is. And as she's doing this, she hears the sound of a key turning in the front door. So she goes to greet him. She calls out to him. Then she stops because she realizes that there's something off about the situation. There are just normal noises that you associate with everyday life. For example, my dog. She had a jingling chain on her collar. And every time I go downstairs, she would look up or she would move or otherwise react. And you'd hear the jingle. And after she passed away, I started realizing that that noise wasn't there. And it was just a little odd and it took some getting used to. So the same thing is happening for this woman. The door has been opened, but she's used to hearing her husband come in and have the keys hit the counter and his briefcase hit the floor, and that's not what's happening. The fact that the sound is different is filling her with a bit of foreboding. And she calls out his name repeatedly, but there's no response. She doesn't see him, but she does see that the door is open. So something's just really wrong. And then she hears there's someone in the kitchen. So she calls out to him again. There's nothing. So she thinks that maybe he's just trying to screw with her, but she's getting this, this bad vibe from everything. And she decides that she's going to go downstairs and look in the kitchen instead of backtracking upstairs to grab their gun that's in their bedroom. So she pulls into view of the kitchen, and she sees Ben's back. It's definitely his, but Ben isn't anywhere to be seen. So she starts freaking out. She says that if he doesn't stop doing this shit, then she's going to call the cops. And she gets no response. So she goes into the kitchen, and as she goes to the phone, she hears footsteps upstairs. Specifically, where the gun is. He steps on, like, a, a part of the carpet that squeaks really loudly so she she's in full-blown panic she grabs the phone she grabs a knife from the night block her plan is to run through the front door and call the cops essentially there's a stranger in her house apparently as she gets to the front door she is stopped by a voice and she's relieved that it's her husband's voice but he has a gun aimed at her. And he tells her to put the knife down and that he's called the cops on her. And he starts shouting at her like a crazy Where is she? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> so, yeah, he, he's screaming that at her. She has no idea what he's talking about. And the chapter ends with him yelling, Where is my wife? Now, I went into that chapter. My wife. I went into more detail with that chapter than I normally do. But I really wanted to get across that this is a great hook for this book in a way that the first two chapters of Head Full of Ghosts was not. What do you (laughs) think about this beginning? I think it's amazing that you hated Karen's blog from Head Full of Ghosts so much. That we're still talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was gonna say a little, a little behind the scenes. We go over most of the questions we want to ask each other about a book before we sit down to record. And when I read this in the script, you had me laughing for about two minutes. <laughs> uh, poor, poor Paul Tremblay, and his his attempt to be one of one of the fellow kids. <laughs> It just went over so bad for you. <laughs> but yeah, I, I agree. This is actually a really good opening scene. It's very cinematic, very much out of a, a horror movie. It reminded me of Scream, like that opening scene with, with Drew Barrymore where she's on the phone and somebody's creeping around the house a little bit. I, I really liked it. And it's like you said with the the bag being in a different place and just just the little minutia of the routine is is off. Peter Klein's for for all the negative things I said about him in the beginning, he does have a really good knack for observation. There's a couple of points in the book where he he just notices like the little things people do and it adds a lot of lived in world and an atmosphere to the books that I haven't seen in too many other authors. 
And this was a really good example of that. Now, as far as the Stephen King heroic author trope, I'm going to challenge you to keep that in mind as you read the next chapter where we're introduced to our protagonist, <laughs> the English teacher, for some reason. So, yeah, please, please tell me, tell me more about Mike. Oh yeah. Okay. So the the that first chapter was just the hook and the setup, and those characters they're talked about, but they're never seen again. They're not focused on. And the next chapter and the rest of the book is going to be about Mike. Do you want me to bring up his name now or later? Uh, I'll talk about his name because I am actually a Sherlock Holmes fan. I have read literally every Sherlock Holmes story written by Arthur Conan Doyle. In Sherlock Holmes, as you may be aware, either the books or the TV show Sherlock, Sherlock has a brother named Mycroft. Mycroft is superior to Sherlock in all of his mental capacities. Mycroft is just a relational database before relational databases were even conceived. But the problem with Mycroft is he has none of Sherlock's passion, which is often a, a point of hilarity because Sherlock is usually portrayed as kind of a, a cold bastard. But Sherlock does do a lot of legwork. He enjoys running around. He's kind of a fighting badass in the stories. And in the books, Mycroft is a, a morbidly obese man who detests having to move. He sits around at his British gentleman's club, not the fun stripper kind, one with actual gentlemen, and just solves little puzzles all day. And occasionally he'll call in Sherlock if he needs somebody to go walk down the street or something. In the show, Mycroft is played by Mark Gatiss, and he's obviously a very thin man, so they kind of did something weird there but they hint at it anyway mycroft is is a man who doesn't fully utilize his mental gifts and so our main character whose actual name is leland something goes by the name mike short for mycroft because in the 10th grade they had to read a series of sherlock stories the ones that introduced the character of Mycroft and all the kids in the class were like, oh, you're like Mycroft and we're just going to call you Mycroft from now on, which I forget exactly what I said to you when I read that sentence. I believe it was like maximum cringe or cringe too yes, far. Yes, <laughs> I said it was a cringe too far because the, oh, okay. So I'm going to explain the character of Mike a little bit. Mike is very smart he's perhaps the smartest person to ever smart and he has a perfect memory he can exactly remember everything as it happens and he also has just amazing mental powers of like spatial manipulation and he can he can actually create like 3D labeled diagrams in his head. And because he has a photographic memory, he can look at a page of text, see all the text, and then look at another page of text, see all the text, and then he can process that later. So he could just quickly like scan books and then read them in his mind. And that's all neat, but it's described as as ants. So he has ants in his brain that collect the images and, and bring them to his like consciousness and they fight and that's how he thinks. And there's, there's black ants and red ants. And, I love your description. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes the black ants fight the red ants, but sometimes there's only black ants. And um, sometimes the ants need to be held back because they the ants want more information but it's not time for more information so he's got to he's got to suppress the ants and then in moments of like great need he'll unleash the ants and they'll do stuff and if it seems like I've been droning on about ants <laughs> for the last several minutes 
Well, buckle up. <laughs> oh my god. Because that's 25% of the book. <laughs> yeah. Um... I did the math. I did the math. It's mentioned on 25% of the pages in the book. 25% of the pages in the 370-page book talk about ants in his brain yeah to carry images and data i i thought the first time that he mentioned it i was like oh that's a neat way of visualizing it and then he he mentioned it again and again and again and again and i was so goddamn sick of hearing about these ants like a tenth of the way through the book it was interesting <laughs> what did you say about superman <laughs> well just as a visual storytelling device i'd use anime as an example imagine if like every time goku went super saiyan it was the full like five minute transformation he did the first time where the hair flashes and the muscles bulge and the hair flashes and he screams and he screams and the eyes go white and he screams and the muscles the bulge and strikes in the yeah. background and, and it does that dark. every time he has to go super saiyan for the rest of the show it's a nice visual storytelling device but it never stops like there, there's a couple of issues i have with it one is that it makes it seem like mike is disconnected from his own mind that there is Mike and there's the ants. And that the only thing any of us, the only thing that differentiates Mike from any of us is that he possesses the ants. If we had the ants, we would also be that smart. Like his intense brain power doesn't seem to have any impact on his personality at all. And they kind of hint that it does when he talks about some of the pain that's associated with having perfect memory and that things are never allowed to fade, that every, every betrayal, every death, everything happened just a minute ago to him. It's all fresh all the time. And, but it affects him very superficially. He says like, can you imagine that? And I was like, I don't know, Mike, I'm not convinced you can. You never act like anything bothers you. He also mentions that there's, he he can be addicted to information and <sighs> Mike's introduction to the point where, where Mike gets into the meat of the, the book. I'm telling you all this up front because the book takes forever to get there. The reason, like, we're not sure why Mike doesn't want to take on the job that he's about to be offered. We're not sure why Mike doesn't run NASA or why he's not living up to his potential. And he hints that like, there's, an addictive obsessive component to his intelligence where it's tempting to just read everything and memorize and just take in all the information he possibly can but he never deals with what the consequences of that would be there's some vague reference and this is why i say like how much work did he put into adapting his college short story because there's an interesting idea there that absolutely this this guy could be driven mad by his own intelligence but they just I, if you're ever looking for this book to deal with that never happen he never experiences anything other than reward and praise for using his intelligence it never has any negative effect on him and it's portrayed as though he needs to like stop being this joe every man and and live up to his potential and that's how he'll he'll free himself and that's how he'll be happy so i'll i'll drop talking about mike for now and please go on with the summary but yeah that's that's mike he's our protagonist everything in this book is from his perspective bar uh, like three chapters and just oof. go on oh my god okay <laughs> so part one uh so Mike is our protagonist. Like we said, he's an English teacher. We learn that he is, he, he's got a photographic memory and he is the, the smartest, per, one of the smartest people in the U.S., if not the world. He, he, he uh, maxed out the IQ test. I forgot he maxed out the <laughs> IQ test. Yep. Maxed it out. Got 100. He took an IQ test. He got 100 and 80 because that's what his IQ is. Stephen Hawking, fucking moron. 
Right, Mike, smartest man possibly alive, but he doesn't want to use his gifts for anything greater than high school education. His friend Reggie, he drops by, he works for DARPA, and he's offered Mike numerous jobs in the past, all of which have been turned down. Reggie tells him that this job will be different. Well, I was going to say real quickly, do you want to explain what DARPA is for our international listeners? Uh... No. <laughs> <laughs> I just want them to figure it out for themselves. <laughs> DARPA is kind of the uh, scientific research wing of the U.S. military. They invented uh, the internet. I thought that was Al Gore. Uh, he helped. Okay, he, w- he was there. He was in the room at the time. Okay. Yeah. So... I'm going to have you discuss the, this next part. So they, they go to a boardroom meeting in Washington, D.C. a week later. And all you, your favorite part of the book. So Reggie takes Mike to a meeting for all the stakeholders of the Albuquerque Door Project. And there's a variety of different higher up people there i believe there's an air force general i yeah he's like one of the highest ranks and there's there's several senators and the team of people who are work uh, or some representatives from the team of working on the albuquerque door now reggie hasn't told mike anything about what they're working on or what this project is correct Correct. He's just kind of like, hey, sit and watch this. Okay, so Mike's on summer break from school. He, he can work on this. This can be his summer job. So he's listening to them talk about this, and he slowly starts to realize some of what they're working on. I should preface this by saying that the team of people who work on the Albuquerque Door Project are represented by Arthur Cross who is the project lead, and it is his baby. He's the theoretical physicist behind it all. Olaf Johansson, who um, is a dick. That's and his role on the team, actually. Be an <laughs> asshole. He's, he, I guess he's actually like Arthur Cross's co-author. He's a theoretical physicist as well, right? I guess? I think that's what he does. and. Jamie, who is a programmer, and she's also very attractive, which if a woman in a room in a Peter Klein's book is attractive, you will know that. Oh, yes. What they're talking about is extending the funding for the Albuquerque Door Project. Now, everybody has a folder of documents in front of them. And the senators are somewhat reluctant to approve another year of funding, considering that they have produced no documentation on how their project works, what it's doing. They, they've only produced results. They're trying to build some sort of instantaneous travel device, like a, a Star Trek teleporter or a, a portal or something like that. Their initial approach to the project was to build the Star Trek style teleport. And that was something that would take apart matter and then beam it across as, you know, electrons or whatever at the speed of light and reassemble it when it got there. And that was going well. And they were 100% positive it was going to work. (laughs) <laughs> and they didn't want to wait for animal trials. So they found a stray dog that was hanging out around their lab. And they put it in the teleporter. And they killed it in the most brutal way possible. And they're sorry. <laughs> but y- y'all need to get over that. That's their attitude. <laughs> that is their attitude. They're, they're kind of dicks about it. As if they were not the ones who did it. Yeah, they're like, we paid the Humane Society or whatever. You know, we self-reported that we broke the rules. Now shut up about it. 
Yeah, like, we could have just lied about it and not reported it. They expect the stakeholders, the people who fund their project, to be grateful that they didn't try to hide it, right? Keep that in mind. So the next question is, what is the current iteration of the project? Well, it's the Albuquerque door. What this does is it folds space and time so that the point you're standing in and the point you want to travel to become right next to each other and you hop over another dimension and into the place you wanted to travel to. It's like a little wormhole. It's it's the it's almost a cliche at this point where you say yeah, you fold the paper. Yeah, the what's paper. the fastest way from this point to this point? You can draw this line or you can fold the paper. Whoa. It's, it's the concept from Event Horizon, concept from Interstellar. It you know, it's a wormhole. We all have some vague idea what that is. So they've, they've built a wormhole. And the people are like, okay, how do you do that? And they're like, we're not going to tell you. Now, keep in mind, this is the same people who literally this previous sentence were saying, you should be grateful that I didn't try to hide it from you. Okay, how does this one work? I'm hiding it from you. They expect several hundred million dollars of funding but they have a contract with DARPA that they do not need to reveal any of the inner workings of the project. They do not need to disclose materials or schematics or, or theories or equations, any deliverable to DARPA until it is time to announce the breakthrough. Because they want to ensure that they get full credit for this. And the stakeholders remind the scientists that this is some of the highest levels of federal government and the, the military and intelligence community. And they say, exactly, you can't even keep your own secret. <laughs> like, they're, they're very antagonistic towards the senator. Like they're, to the point, they're antagonistic to the people who hold their fate in their hands. Yes, and the reason this scene bothered me so much is because they're they're not merely politely declining to show their material; they are actively insulting. To, I I guess this is like a congressional committee. I'm not quite sure i call them stakeholders because they're a collection of people from different branches of the government but they all seem to have some role in signing off on the funding at a bare minimum it really doesn't matter how interesting or promising your project is i think darpa is very unlikely to make that kind of agreement with you that you don't need to reveal any of the inner workings of your project to them purely for national security reasons. You're not going to get hundreds of millions of dollars from DARPA to work on what, you know, maybe a bomb that you're going to turn around and sell to the Russians and we'd have no defense against because we don't know how it works. It stretches the limits of believability that they would even have this contract. It further stretches the limits of believability that they could be this antagonistic towards the board who is approving their project and one, still get funding, two, not have their materials and research seized and possibly be thrown in jail for contempt of Congress. They've already broken laws, like by their own admission. They, they already rushed into animal testing. So I'll, I'm going to put a pin in that for now and go on, but that... I know I seem pedantic, and I know I seem nitpicky, but I'm, I'm going to make a point about that. So they go on to explain that they've had several successful test runs of the Albuquerque door, including just object trials where they, they transport an object through the door, successful animal trials with uh, rats, dogs, and primates, and successful human trials including every member of the scientific team and Reggie and his assistant as well. And Reggie can vouch that the door does indeed work. Now, the senators then ask, what about the Ben Miles situation? 
and the scientists take the tone of what about it it's very unfortunate what happened to ben miles <laughs> and the stakeholders ask do you not see any connection between a man going through your door as ben miles was one of the people who went through the door right before coming back and pointing a gun at his wife do you not see any connection between a man going through your door and then having a psychological break like that's th those two things couldn't be related to you and olaf says something to the effect of well he also took uh you know a jet to get from california to washington too are you are you going to investigate american airlines it's like well i would perhaps if the 747 was an experimental theoretical physics project that uh, no one knew how it worked. But as it turns out, Boeing will provide the government <laughs> with diagrams of their plane. Um, so I think Boeing is actually in the clear, but I still have some suspicions about your door. If I had to put money on which one was at fault. <laughs> yeah. And they, they explain that there is no way that it could have been the door because the door doesn't affect the matter that transfers through it in any way. The door folds space-time around the people, but not, it, doesn't tr it doesn't break them down and send them anywhere. It doesn't change the person. It just connects two different points in space-time. And the stakeholders, of course, ask, can you prove that? No. We're, well, I mean, we could, but we, we don't want to. And they thought, checkmate. <laughs> yeah, checkmate. Uh, we have a what? contract, Shit. sir. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> guess, you got us, guess you got us again. So... Mike is very interested in all this, and this is what Reggie brought him in to figure out. What, if anything, is going on with this team? They won't share any of their research. They're being very argumentative. They're being very paranoid and protective, but they do produce results. Reggie has been through the door. He didn't experience any negative side effects, but he wants to know if they're hiding something if the door is safe, what's going on? And Mike is intrigued enough that he's going to take this job and he's going to go live with this team for a while and figure out to the best of his ability what's going on. And he chose Mike for this because Mike's brain will allow him to glean from his interactions with he's these got people. Ants. He's got these yeah. ants in his brain. He's got these ants in his brain that will allow him to take in all the information. So I want to go back a couple of steps now that we've explained that Mike is going and talk about the problems I actually have with this. Yeah, I was going to say, you're really underselling this. You eviscerated this chapter in text messages I, to me. I just wanted to get through it. So... This is where the book starts to go off the rails for me. Three chapters in, if you're Three chapters down. in. So, this is a mystery. I don't like mystery books in general, be except for the greats. Like, I, I, I obviously like the Sherlock Holmes stories. I like um, Agatha Christie. I like... I'm shocked uh, to hear that, actually. I figured you would be enthralled by mystery books. I don't usually like them because a lot of them either it, it's it takes a really talented person to write a mystery well because it's you need to be able to sort of it either needs to be a fun enough ride that you don't care that it's not possible for the reader to solve it or it has to be possible for the reader to solve it but difficult enough that they probably won't or if they do, it's so rewarding that they don't care that it's they've spoiled it for themselves. I like mystery when it's well done. And 
the foundation of this mystery is already bad. When you stretch the limits of believability, so much of this, this book is trying to figure out why these people are acting so strangely. But the rules of our world don't seem to apply to this world. I cannot believe that in my world, a member of DARPA experiences a serious psychological break after going through an experimental machine. And those people get to go, the people responsible for building that machine get to go in, demand secrecy, demand that no one accuse them of anything, and demand more money. And no one's research materials are seized, no one is arrested, and nothing is investigated except by one guy whose only credentials are he's an English teacher. And yeah, he's a genius, that's great. I don't care, and neither would anyone on that board. You don't think they would say, oh, you maxed out the IQ test? No, because I think they'd realize you can't do that. <laughs> that's not how it's IQ not, tests work. That's not at all how that works, no. Yeah, so I just, so my problems with the scene, like one, it's frustrating because the scientists establish themselves as being so utterly unlikable that they never shake that through the rest of the book. Oh yeah, I was going to say, that that's uh, that's not going anywhere. They will just keep being worse and worse. Their sense of entitlement is palpable. I've got a feeling it's supposed to play as suspicious and defensive, but it is so overplayed. It's overplayed to the point where it's not, I don't believe these are real people. I don't believe this is really happening. And it's a problem that, that becomes compounded in the rest of the book. My, my initial suspicions were well-founded because you can't solve this mystery, even though I did. <laughs> I was going to say, you guessed what was guess going it. on about three <laughs> chapters in. But <laughs> well, I guess what was going on with the door three chapters in, there was a little metagaming going on there because I knew I knew we were in the threshold universe and I knew I, I just know what Peter Klein's influences were. So I, I've also seen the twilight zone. I have also seen the episode of house where the person has the photographic memory. Do you agree that this entire scene is not believable? You know, I could have done without this entire scene. I, I, I just kind of, I just kind of blew through it the first time. And then when I started looking at it more, I'm like, they really didn't need this scene because it makes the U.S. government look like just impotent or it makes these guys and it makes these guys look just they're they're acting as uh, cartoon villains with mustaches that they twirl. Right. What do you so, mean? He, he also flew on a plane. Ha 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 ha! You can't trace it back to us. Well, yeah, it's like I liked that. I, I liked make love the Bruce Campbell way, where he runs into Colin Powell and he deals with the security and everything. Bruce Campbell. I like, would love to see this book rewritten by Bruce Campbell. Can we make that happen? The what I'm what I'm trying to say is. When you're, I, I don't know if, I don't know what the tone of this book is. Is it a, is it a comedy sci-fi mystery like 14? If so, why is it not funny? Well, it's, it's like, where's the charm? Where's the likable characters? If it's a comedy, why am I not having fun? And if it's a serious mystery, why is it not taking itself seriously? Why is it making... Like, I think this scene was supposed to be kind of funny with Mike being out of place and Reggie. Like, I think the U.S. government was supposed to be kind of bumbling and goofy. But it's like, then people, I, I won't go into spoil. Like, I, I want to get to these things in order. But the tone waffles wildly. There will be scenes of brutal, gory violence later in the book. 
and they're not funny. And there will be scenes of awkward social interaction, and they're not funny. They're, they're just awkward. It's just Olaf is very frustrated in this scene, and it's not funny. He's just frustrated. And so I don't know what the rules are. I guess that's part of my problem with this mystery. There's a lot what, of that in this book. What does the government, what is the government actually prepared to do to these people? What is actually at stake for these people? Why? Like, and they just keep saying, our invention is going to change everything. We're going to win every Nobel prize for the next 10 years. It's like, but none of you have published a theory about any of it. Like ever you, it's just not how science works. It's not how the government works. It's not how anything works. And it's, it just strikes me as I couldn't be bothered to do research on what it's like to work on a federal project. I couldn't bother to do any research on previous DARPA projects. Like there's, there's plenty of comedy and, and bumbling idiocy. Like there's, there's very famous story of how, Reagan watched the movie War Games with Matthew Broderick and turned to somebody in a meeting and said, hey, can that actually happen? And they went back and they looked into it and they're like, yeah, we've actually got a really serious problem. <laughs> um, <laughs> there, is a, there is a certain amount of bumbling idiocy to the U.S. government, but it just it's not like Matthew Broderick walked up to Reagan and was like, Hey boss, man, fuck you. And he's like, mm, I don't like you, but I'm going to approve this funding. Cause you're a pretty smart guy. Like I guarantee if you tell any high ranking, like high, high, high ranking military official, you don't need to know what I'm working on. That is the fastest way for them to go to a secret court, get a search warrant, and find out what you're working on. Like, all I need to say is something, something national security. Oh, you're going to win every Nobel Peace Prize? Oh, you're going to win every Nobel Prize for the next 10 years? That sounds like that could be a threat to national security. That sounds like you could change the world, and maybe not in a good way. Seized. <laughs> Later on, Mike actually says, uh, Reggie can just send some guys in and seize everything and uh shit arthur i almost called him alfred arthur was like no we've got a contract i'm like you're gonna wave that contract at soldiers who are storming your base is that gonna stop there's, them there's another scene where bob says they mentioned that like aren't you afraid reggie just come take your stuff and bob's like well he'd have to i mean unless they're actually going to send in the army, like people with guns, then that's not going to happen. And I was like, okay, number one, you're describing police. Number two, that actually happens in the book. Number two, you work for the army. <laughs> unless you said you're at an guns. army base, <laughs> you're at an army base guarded by soldiers. <laughs> like, for fuck's sake, like, I'll I'll leave it back to you. Is there anything else in the court scene you want? Uh, no, we we spent a a nice chunk of time on that. Oh, I told you we weren't going to get. <laughs> <laughs> so so after the court scene, Reggie and Mike talk one on one. Can Reggie bro to bro? And... Yeah, bro to bro. They do have really good chemistry. They should have. They, I'm telling you. The way they speak to each other, they're flirting. Yeah. Oh, you, you big jerk. <laughs> they say that. They say that. Like, they, like you know uh, you're a jerk, right? They definitely such... could have ended up with one another. It would have been a lot better than what we got. Yeah, we, it would have made a lot more sense. So they talk to each other, bro to bro, and Reggie tells him that the reason he's sending Mike in is that there's something weird going on over there. Other than the fact that all three of these people are assholes openly to the U.S. government. They say that people are taking more sick days and that 
their interactions are really off and Reggie can't really describe what he means, but he says like the analogy is when you're in a rush and you put on a t-shirt, but it's on backwards, even if there's not a tag on the t-shirt, you can just feel that it's wrong somehow. And that's what it's like being out there. And he thinks that the employees can also feel if there's something off. Any other thoughts on that was all part one. Yeah. Well, and it'll go a little smoother after this because we've laid the groundwork for some of the main problems, I think. I think so, too. All right. Mike arrives at the facility. There are seven people here. And aside from Jamie, the programmer, Arthur, the team lead, and Olaf, the asshole, I could not tell you what any of them did. There's Sasha and Neil. Sasha's trait is that she says, fuck me, all the time whenever she gets upset. Can I pause you? Sure. I always like to, before we record, I like to go out and sort of get the consensus of how people felt about a book. And a bunch of people said that exact thing about Sasha. That's her, that's her personality. Fuck me. You are not exaggerating. I would say it's 60% of her dialogue. Yeah, it's, that's, it's crazy. That's it. That's it. Maybe Sasha has, she's always wearing a Star Trek shirt. I don't know if these are real Star Trek shirts that actually exist, but she's always wearing a comedic Star Trek shirt. So, okay, that's her personality. Star Trek and fuck me. And then there's Neil, who is either an introvert or has no personality. I don't I... know what you're talking about. Neil is married. That's important. That's, that's a thing. Yes. yes. Uh, Sasha is also gay, I believe. Maybe? I think she is. You might be right. Because I th- they mentioned her hitting on Anne. Yeah, I was about to say, then there's the secretary, Anne, whose name I had to look up, who has no relevance to the story. And I honestly thought she might be a surprise like love interest because she has a little scene with Mike, but it goes nowhere and she drops out of the story for another like 100 pages before she shows back up to do nothing. Her she's big... the only one who doesn't greet Mike by spitting in his face. Yeah, that's true, because she's not part of the group. She's an outsider that was hired. And yeah, she she's the only one that doesn't call him an asshole. And then there's there's Bob, friendliest toward Mike, who has the most portal walking experience, and also an uncomfortable scene where he once again uh, hits on Anne repeatedly, even though she's told him to fuck off several times. Bob's a bit weird, but apparently he's the uh, he's the prankster, he's the jokester, even though he doesn't do any of that ever that we see. Am I missing anything with with these well defined and diverse cast of fun characters? No, I I agree a hundred percent. I actually have notes that have almost to the exact words you used <laughs> descriptions of the characters. I would add, I do know what they do. I do know what the roles on the project are. Well, I just read um, that Neil was an engineer, so I think Sasha is also an engineer. Neil and Sasha are engineers. They are responsible for building the mechanisms of the doorway. What is Bob? And I think Bob is sort of just a jack-of-all-trades on the project. He goes where he's needed. He does maintenance and a little bit of the coding and such. Jamie is the only software developer. Right. And And Olaf is the number two to Arthur. Yeah, Arthur and Olaf are the two guys who actually supposedly understand the the actual physics behind what's going on. And Arthur dictates algorithms to Jamie and she codes them. So Mike meets Arthur and reveals his magic memory. And then... They go to a demonstration of the door where Olaf goes from gate A to gate B and then back. Gate I'm going to need to pause you. I'm okay. going to need to pause you. Uh, why is it called the Albuquerque door? Because Bugs Bunny. Bugs Bunny? Does somebody there watch Bugs Bunny? Apparently, Arthur is a Looney Tunes fanatic. But scientists are supposed to be serious people. Well, if it helps, young Ben... Arthur never mentions Looney Tunes, like, ever. He just named it after Bugs Bunny. I don't it's, think he ever mentions that again. 
No, he doesn't. It's almost like uh, giving people quirks is not the same as giving them personalities. But they all have a lot of fucking quirks. Except Neil. Neil doesn't have much. <laughs> Neil is the <laughs> Neil's the white bread. He's Neil, Neil doesn't even get a quirk. <laughs> Neil should have been the guy that liked Bugs Bunny. Olaf. Uh, so Gate B is in a separate facility that's still on the property. It's what, like a mile away, something like that. So yeah. they, they cross over from Gate A to Gate B, and there are cameras over there, so they can see that Olaf is over there. And then he crosses, uh, oh no, he doesn't cross back, that's right. Now, everyone is an asshole to Mike every chance they get. He'll ask questions, and not about the inner workings of how it works, but basic things like, why did you set this up so that you need two people to operate it? And the response is, because we did it like that. That was Jamie, by the way, that would be important later. Hey, idiots, this guy is going to make or break your funding. When the government comes by to survey a hospital, you don't necessarily like them being there, but everyone is on their best behavior because they can do bad things to you. They can fine you, they can shut you down, so be on your best fucking behavior. No one walks up to the government people and say, you guys are fucking assholes for being here and we hate you. Because that's not going to end well. But these assholes are all over Mike. Any any minor question he asks, they just shit all over him. And it's like, you know he can just tell Reggie, yeah, this thing is dangerous, shut it down. And you're all out of jobs, and all your work is seized. You got, who the you got more like, I hate fired it. up about that than I did. <laughs> I'm like, who, who talks like that to someone who has that kind of power over their future? Yeah, again, it's it's supposed to be suspicious, but it's just too much. It's it's too much. And it's annoying to read because in real life it just wouldn't happen. There's there's so many things you as a reader find yourself wanting to say that just never get said. Uh, again, I can only think it's just a lack of research. I've worked on projects for various clients, we'll say. And this just isn't how these arrangements work. So I get they have a very non-traditional contract with DARPA. We'll say their research was special enough to warrant a special agreement with DARPA. I don't think it is. Even seeing what they've done here, I don't think they would get the contract they supposedly have. But let's, let's concede that point. What they're doing could be considered a, a very serious national security. At the very least, they're they're folding space, right? Right. So, you know, I, I'm a lay person. I don't know much about space time, but I know I live there, and I don't necessarily think it's harmless that you're folding it like <laughs> i know that i live there that's yes that is true um, um i would there's, be, there's, you know there's it, just it a million me, ways how many people got freaked out about the large hadron collider yeah <laughs> exactly well and it's, it's because there's they say like we're making mini black holes and the mini black holes evaporate very quickly and they basically they exist for like less than a second. But black holes are bad, right? Like like what if they don't? <laughs> like, <laughs> like at the very least to now, granted, I'm not gonna understand the science you tell me to explain why you know they're going to evaporate, but I would have an independent third party who does understand such things, who has maybe maybe not an independent third party, but a third party who has my interests look at your data and say, yeah, this is safe before I, I'm like, okay. And that's what they're trying to do with Mike. And it's a totally reasonable request. And I just can't imagine how any project, especially a project that's showing the results they're showing, like it's one thing to fund theoretical physics that operates on paper or in simulation or on a small scale. 
it's another thing to have a device that is totally working and in multiple human trials and in fact being run casually every day and you won't tell anyone how it works and people are getting sick from using it i've worked on things that are so much less sensitive than this and there's still all sorts of testing and checking and deliverables and I think it would be better, like, I, I genuinely do think that the government would rather this not exist than it exists and they don't understand it. I think people are much more likely to destroy something that they don't understand how it works. Like, the Large Hadron Collider, like, you don't have to publish in National Geographic that this is how my Large Hadron Collider works, but somebody in the country where you're building it has to know how it works. And, and one of the things Reggie's even asking Mike to do is like, I just need you to find out like, is he writing it down somewhere? Like, what if this dude gets hit by a bus? Right. What if the thing fucking blows up one day and the whole team gets wiped out? It's not at all unreasonable for DARPA to want to have backups. And it doesn't make sense that they wouldn't insist on it as a condition of the funding. Because Arthur is saying this like, oh, you you need me more than I need you. It's like, absolutely not, sir. I have money. And I have your passport. Like, <laughs> <laughs> And I you have can't dudes tell with me. guns. <laughs> well, yeah, you can't tell me you're going to build this thing where it's like, I could build a doorway into the I'm also not clear on how the doorway works. They mentioned, like, does there need to be a site B? Because we'll I, get into you're that. not, we'll have to yeah, get you, into that. <laughs> you're not aware of the existence of site B until they get there, but they explain it to him as like, this portal can send you anywhere. But I, I guess it's only anywhere as long as an opposing, like as, as long as you can get to the other place and build the gate. But it doesn't make sense because they keep saying like, I could send somebody to the other side of space or London or whatever. It just takes the same amount of energy, but it's like you can, you can only send them to a place where you've already built another gate. It's very, I'm, I was confused on that. That, that is true until it's not true, but yeah, it's the behavior makes no sense. There are arguments for why they've wanted to do what they want to do. All right. We've, we've shit on them for long enough. Uh, let, yeah. Let's wrap this up for part two. So after Mike's test with Olaf, or sorry, after Olaf's test where he goes through the gate, Mike is talking with Arthur about nothing really important, and then Olaf bursts into the room and causes a scene. He swears that Bob changed their offices out, and Arthur goes to check. Everything's there as it should be, but Ar Olaf insists his office has been switched, and no one thinks to question it, and... It's like, okay, this guy just went through a portal that an army colonel went through and then became crazy. Why isn't anyone thinking something's going on here? You and mean anyone including super genius Mike? No, not, not even super genius, maxed out the IQ Mike. Understands. Not even the ants. The ants not didn't even, the even yeah. they didn't even scritchy scratch at that. Because they're always like clawing and scratching and... I'm going to gloss over several chapters in part two now because it's just, in sarcastic air quotes again, character build. Mike talks to various members of the team. He learns what the rings are made out of from Neil. He learns that they're replacing seemingly working components for no discernible reason. Jamie tells him, and I quote, We're not doing anything wrong. Don't screw us over. Which is very convincing and definitely what innocent people say. They're running a lot of tests on this seemingly working technology, quote, because it has to be perfect. Mike goes to dinner with Bob, who has something he wants to tell Mike, but he hesitates and ends up saying nothing because Olaf comes by. And for the life of me, I don't know what he was going to say. And I don't know if it ever gets resolved. I do. <laughs> 
it does come up again. Uh, the group admits that they feel like Bob has been acting different, and they they mention it's nothing they could really put their finger on. He but wasn't pointing seemed... his gun at his wife. No, no, but it did seem like he just he seemed like a stranger to them, and they had noticed it, and they had been talking about it behind his back. And Bob, I think, did get the sense that they were talking behind his back. I see. So to to summarize. An army colonel went through this portal and then became crazy and pointed his gun at his wife. Olaf thought that Bob switched his entire office with Olaf somehow. He, Olaf, or I guess Bob is like superhuman and he's really strong and really fast and has amazing organizational skills. And Bob is like a stranger to everyone. And no one thinks, I wonder if this has anything to do with this gateway through another dimension. But they'd probably just, you know, chalk that up to maybe Bob was on an airplane recently and he lost his mind. So that's what I just described. What we went through was a whole section of the book. Well, two sections. Um, two, yeah. Yeah, the, the second section is a lot of character interaction. But it doesn't flesh out the characters much. You don't get anything from them. It's just Mike introducing himself to all these cardboard cutouts with faces on them. I do want to say a couple of things that that got glossed over. Some things that are important are the living situation. They uh, everybody lives in a series of like double wide trailers that are parked just off to the side of site A and. Mike is with the given... exception of Arthur, who goes home. To yeah, his with the wife. exception. Yeah, I'm sorry. With the exception of Arthur, who lives uh, in his house with his wife, 45 minutes away. Mike is given one of those trailers, and he's going to be staying there. Mike has been given detailed dossiers of all of the team members, and he's been given a variety of different materials that he can read. The background of project. So he goes in pretty much. Knowing the answers to a lot of questions, the team is very defensive around him. They, they definitely don't want to talk to him. They don't want him there. They say in no uncertain terms that they don't want him there. They're very just petulant and whiny. Yeah, with well, him. tough shit. He is there, and you're not going to get funding if he doesn't give a good report. So suck up to him. Make him a like, really nice party or whatever when he first shows up. And just do your best to skirt around the more sensitive topics and give him what he needs to give you a good report. Everybody accuses him. So there's only two people that are even remotely nice to him. And that is Anne and Bob. Arthur seems to reach an understanding with him that Arthur is going to work with him to a point to assuage Reggie's fears about the project, but he's not going to reveal how the project works. And Mike seems to be okay with that. He says, I just need to see enough to know that this is indeed safe and works and you're not trying to scam Reggie. And, and that's the thing that just boggles my mind is like, they can't understand how their behavior looks like they're the ones trying to scam the government. How you've given the government nothing, but you've taken hundreds of millions of dollars. And they accuse Mike of trying to steal their research, which again, I am unclear as to the terms of their contract because does DARPA not own this? <laughs> yes, DARPA owns your research. They are paying you money for this project and its research. But like when it goes live, the, the stipulation is that they get the credit for the theory. Woohoo. Yeah, yeah, but like they're not going to be allowed to, like you can't publish just how, how to make a, an atom bomb, you know? Like a lot of people get credit for the theory of that. I mean, their, their thing is still going to be deeply secret. I just want to reiterate, it's not pedantic to have problems with knowing what, what's its, what the stakes are and what the rules are. Their behavior doesn't make sense, and granted, it's not supposed to make sense. 
supposed to be suspicious and weird, but I don't know which parts are suspicious and weird because the whole situation is, and maybe that's, maybe, maybe I'm being too critical. Do you, like, do you think that's, what do you think Peter Kleins was trying to set up? Like, do you think he's trying to set up who do I trust Reggie or the team? I no, no, <laughs> I don't think he was trying to set that up. I think he was trying to set up that there's this team of recluses who have something weird going on in their facility and you gotta you gotta figure out what it is but yeah no one no one comes off as on the surface they're on the level and then they have hidden secrets beneath that they all come off as weird almost not even human because again all the people i know who have oversight they aren't assholes to the people who are overseeing them directly to their face. So let me ask you this question. Just, I think he just didn't do a good job setting up what he wanted to set up. Well, let, let me ask you this. Do you think perhaps they're all being affected the way Ben Miles was affected? And maybe that's why they're unrealistic assholes, because they've all been driven insane by the door? Uh... Well, have they all flown on airlines recently, is what I need to know first. Well, at least three of them have. Ooh, oh shit, okay. they got to Washington. Well, huh, well, Neil doesn't seem like he's acting weird, because uh, he's, not, he's not doing or saying anything at all. And Sasha, uh, she likes Star Trek, and she seems to still like Star Trek. Uh, and Anne seems to be pretty friendly. So the three who flew on that plane might have been affected by that plane. I don't know what Bob's excuse is. Um, I don't know if I can find a, a common denominator between all five of those people. Uh, the three in DC, Ben Miles, and Bob. I guess they all so, went through that door. But... They did, and we didn't mention that. They all went through the door. Do you, like, let's mention uh, how they reassure him that it's working. By they've, proving to him that the door has been used hundreds of times. Yes, they've all been through the door. And Bob has gone through more than anyone else. And coincidentally, Bob is also being suspected by his peers of being a little off right now. So what do you think? Do you think deep down these people suspect that the door doesn't work? Or do you think they're 100% genuine? I think that they think that the door works. And they are in such deep denial because later on in the book, they will say things and I will go, how did you not catch that? And their response was, well, the lighting was a little different, I think. Uh, it could have been this. Um, it could have been that. It's like, uh-huh. Or it could have been this interdimensional door that you built. I'm just saying. I think that they think it works because they are willing to deny all other possibilities that it does not work or that it does not work how they think it works. Do you think we're supposed to like them? You know, I think we're supposed to like Bob. And I think we're, for some reason, supposed to like Jamie, even though she's one of the worst ones. I don't know if we're supposed to like Mike, though. That's a big problem. He's the main <laughs> character, and I don't know if we we're supposed to feel anything about him. I know in 14, we were supposed to like and relate to Nate. I liked Nate. He was the charming everyman. Mike seems like like a computer or something. I was going to mention that, too. We would say, according, according to our initial breakdown, that this finishes like the first act. I think it's fair at this point to ask this question. Okay. What does Mike want? What's what is Mike's motivation? Why did he take this job, do you think? He took this job because Reggie volunteered him for it and said if you don't take it, I'm fucked, so you have to take it now. And Mike was like, "Well, I guess I have summer break to just do whatever." Mike does not seem to have the agency that a an active protagonist has. He's really passive. And he just kind of goes along with it. And the only reason he's investigating this door is because that's his job. He doesn't seem like he really wants to get to the bottom of this the way Nate does in 14, 
Mike just hits his hits his money. He he gets paid for this. His love interest Reggie, or his should have been love interest Reggie, wants him to do this. So do you think Mike was happy as a teacher? You know, it sounds like he was happy as a teacher because he didn't want to leave that job. Or as happy as he thinks he could be. He never seems like he was wanting for anything else but to teach high school English. See, I think I was getting, and this is going back to comparing and contrasting Mike and Nate from 14. I think both of them are people who want more, but for whatever reason, they've just been afraid to like go for it. And I think that's what we're supposed to, uh, that's what we're supposed to get the only from Mike. E- the only evidence I have of that from Mike is in the final chapter of the book where he accepts a job offer and he says Mycroft wouldn't do that that is the only time I thought that he wanted something more out of his life than what he had there is definitely i mean it's stated outright that he's he's transforming from Mycroft into Sherlock. Someone does call him Sherlock at some point in the book. Part seven is called Sherlock. <sighs> <laughs> yep. So that's that's a not so subtle character arc. It's it's Mycroft into Sherlock. It's another issue of why why Mike is kind of unlikable because he just I don't get him. I don't know what he wants. Like he's an English teacher and he seems there were just so many ways this could have been done better. Like I think I, well, I think I get what his, his lit professor probably didn't like about it. It's like, okay, you got your guy, you got your call to adventure, whatever. But he seems happy and fulfilled where he is. I don't know if he enjoys teaching. Maybe he's bored by it. Maybe he's afraid of fully embracing his intellect because he's afraid that will make him miserable, which I think is something he does state. He outright. does state that, yes. Yeah. So he doesn't want to be miserable. So he's afraid of living up to his potential. And by the end of the book, he's no longer afraid of living up to his potential, but nothing's changed. No. He doesn't undergo any sort of emotional journey, he doesn't change as a character. There's nothing to him. And that's, no, and I, that's different but, from Nate, again, who we're contrasting with. Because it's by the same author in the same universe. Nate is a guy who doesn't have a lot going for him, and he makes conscious decisions to change throughout the book. And eventually he finds a family with his neighbors, he finds a love interest, and he finds a purpose in his life. Yeah, like, the ideas that are suggested in this book are much better explored in 14. I mean, I, we can, we've said that so many times now. Uh, part three is called bugs in the system. And this is where things are going to start to get a little more interesting. Mike has been focusing in on some of the more obvious discrepancies in the paperwork that the team has allowed him to analyze. He's trying to discern exactly why they would be replacing components so often. He suspects that it might be some sort of embezzlement scheme, but he realizes that they couldn't be making money off of it the, the way they're doing it. He confronts Arthur about it, and Arthur tries to weasel around the topic by saying that, well, maybe the pipe was leaking. Mike says, I've got a photographic memory. I know for a fact it was never leaking. And... After a little bit of back and forth, Arthur finally admits that the reason they're replacing parts so frequently is to justify keeping all the personnel on staff. Now that the doorways are built and they're pretty easy to maintain, they don't really have a need for their engineers and you know the people doing the active maintenance. So Arthur is afraid that if they were to be out of a job, that they may be tempted to break their non-disclosure agreements And Mike's a little surprised that he doesn't trust his team. And he asks Arthur, you know, do you think they'd really do that? And Arthur says, you know, two years ago, I would have said no. But now he kind of trails off that, like, maybe he he just feels like he doesn't know them anymore. Mike also identifies some strange discrepancies in the experiment law. 
there are several logs where an experiment is scheduled and supposedly performed, but the doorway never opened and nothing is recorded in the notes. And it was Jamie who signed off on those experiments. So he confronts Jamie about that. And she tells him that the doorway was set on an automatic timer. And she actually brings, brings the paper over to his trailer at night. And she says, this is, my, this is my code. I wrote a timer in C++. And that it's supposed to automatically power up the door and power it down. But for some reason, even though the timer code worked perfectly, the doorway would not open. So they temporarily shelved those experiments and moved on to other work. Well, well, hold but, on. The reason Jamie brought it over is because Mike thought maybe the code was wrong, and she got pissed at him and yes. basically threw the notes in his face, said, try to find an error, you asshole, and don't call me after work again. And Bob takes this as a good sign because she's going easy on him. Yeah. Yeah, and I was going to avoid talking about it, but I might as well. <laughs> So Mike teaches himself C++. <laughs> he's so smart. He's just so smart. And he checks her timer program. And he's, he finds out she's right. That program should have worked. And I, I just... So much time is spent talking about... If I'm being pedantic about... The, the problems I have with the way people interact. Please, please count the pages that are dedicated to the pseudoscience. There, there is a, at least, at least 10 pages in one chapter describing components that I don't care about and are never mentioned again. And this timer program being written in C++, like, okay, yes, that's a language. I, I'm happy you know the name of it. It's not, it's not hard to follow code. Like, if anyone knows algebra, not that hard to follow computer code and it's it's especially not hard to write a timer you could definitely follow the code for a timer um pretty sure you would just import a library say like timer.start you know it, it whatever <laughs> but it's fine it's, it's, it's all fine um <laughs> so yeah mike Mike's talking to Reggie, and yeah, he, he confirms that the, the program should have worked so um, I think that listeners now realize. I do something in healthcare, you do something in computers. <laughs> do they? I don't know. Is that the first time I ever mentioned computer? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love whenever people talk about computer code as a way to prove intelligence. Because it's like, I don't know. I I have learned so many languages by being told hey ben you're we're doing it in this today like <laughs> like this one's gonna be written in c plus plus and qml go learn qml and you just do it like it's it's not it's not rocket science like i just i i always get a kick out of mike mentions he's like oh it's just syntax and grammar it's just like learning another language i mean superficially i suppose yes uh, it's it's not hard that's that's my main point it's anyone can code more a question of how how good are you at controlling your attention span regardless the next day they are going to do another crosswalk and of course it's going to be bob who's who's doing the crosswalk and mike will be allowed to be on the floor for this one uh, Which so is weird they, because they hate Mike so much, but they well, allowed him Arthur to... seems to be warming up to him. Yeah, I think part of that is not immediately going. You're embezzling. Yes, he, he he's well, and and that's Mike trying to point out, like, I'm really not here just to find a reason to trust you. For for God's sake, like one more time, just one more time. You're here to find a reason to bust us. It's like no, you're doing a bang up job of defunding yourselves. Like when you walk into funding meetings with stakeholders and you tell them to fuck off, that's a good way to get defunded. You don't yes. need my help. I'm done. I'm not talking about it anymore. Bob insists they do a physics test before they complete the crosswalk. And so he and Mike start tossing a baseball back and forth through the door. And it's, it's so much fun. And, and 
Bob says, now you're thinking with portals. And I laugh. He is pretty funny. When was that's, it published? Years after Portal, I think. That's, uh, 20, like, hello. 12, maybe. Hello, fellow kids. <laughs> 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 that's a video game reference for you. Little, little topical humor. So somebody says something, and Mike looks up for a second, and that's when he sees everybody's jaw fucking drop. And people start to, like, scream, and he turns back around. Bob is standing there, skin completely discolored, his hair and teeth falling out, his clothes are in tatters, soaked with blood. He's got some sort of hole right under his rib cage that, that blood is just pouring out of, and he collapses. The rest of the team tries to stable him, but he wangs his head. Mike tries to stabilize him by calling for a blanket, and I was like, what the fuck is that gonna do? We need to keep him warm. Never mind the fact that he's bleeding everywhere. <laughs> yeah, I. There's a lot of he. He does that again at the end. It's like he calls for a blanket again at the end. It's like <laughs> okay, uh, well, why don't you just call for CPR? <laughs> Fuck it. Like <laughs> all I hey I I watch a lot of YouTube and I hear chest compressions, chest compressions. I chest I actually I remember making a joke about. TV doctors. The patient can't breathe. Quick, put them on oxygen. It's like, okay. <laughs> Blow the oxygen in their face. Yeah, it's like, what's that gonna do? <laughs> okay, back to uh, this Back to this uh, monumental scene with Bob. I actually did so, like this a lot. So, uh, yes. This, so this was cool. Like, it was actually very, very creepy. Yeah, uh, you don't expect can... it. He he walks and then he turns around and suddenly there's a fucking monster that looks like Bob, essentially. Yeah, like you don't expect it, but at the same time it was like set up by the other events of the story. Kleins can write when he wants to write, obviously, because we both liked 14. And I suspect this is something that was not in the original short story. No, you know what? It might have been. It might have been. But it was definitely redone. You can tell this was one of the parts that he really enjoyed writing and wanted to do. And it's like he was just kind of rushing through the first half of the book to get to this point. Yes. Well, <laughs> rush is a strong word for the first <laughs> half of the book. Yeah. He was, he was rushing slowly. <laughs> oh, my God. There were so many pages of, like... It's a plastic shell with depleted uranium encased in lead, and we're not using the uranium <laughs> radiation. We're using the uranium because it's heavy. And there's a lot of copper wiring that runs through this and that. And we've got, you know, you got to activate it with two people on both sides. But on, on site B, <laughs> we've got some bicycles that you can take between the two sites if you don't want to take the doorway and there's the control room up top that I could go like, that's how that reads. It's just I think like we found the part of it <laughs> that goes at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I can make you happy. <laughs> Like, that's how that goes, though. My God. Were you not bored by that? <laughs> Am I the only one? Okay. It was It was a bit difficult. I'll, I'll, I'll give you that. You just like my voice. Yes. <laughs> that's how I imagine Neil sounds. <laughs> that's Neil's voice in my head. <gasps> oh, no, my wife. <laughs> you mean I've been cheating on my wife with my wife? <laughs> Oh, no! It's like, Neil, you just you just discovered the confirmed existence of infinite years living out every... <laughs> Take a minute to not be a fucking nerd, please. And... An autopsy reveals that Bob's injuries did not occur instantaneously. That he had developed a variety of cancers with radiation exposure seeming the most likely cause. And the cancers would have taken a period of months to develop. He also had a wound in I his think he, side. I think they said that he had all the cancer. Yes, he had cancer, cancer of like every major system. 
but they said that pancreatic cancer was causing his skin discoloration. Okay, medical expert. Is that accurate? Can you get all the cancer? <laughs> well, supposedly he asked an expert in his uh, afterward about what would happen if you were exposed to that much radiation. And, and that's what they said, I guess. Do you agree? I... I have no fucking clue. I assume you would die from one form of cancer before you start developing all of the cancer. Yeah, I mean... Or I... radiation sickness, or, I mean... There are other ways to die of radiation than just, you got cancer from it. I guess he did talk to somebody, so he did some research. Bob dies, and obviously, the more Mike finds out in the autopsy, the more Mike finds out that... This damage just cannot be explained by simply walking through the portal. It's like Bob had been gone for a year. And they also examine a few things Bob said before he, before he died. Um, <laughs> oh, I love this. He, he warned them that now, now he was missing a few teeth and, and literally bleeding to death. So... He may have slurred his speech slightly, but I think he I think he might have warned them that that mon, mons mobsters mo, mon monsutas. Uh no, I think yes, yes, he was warning us that the monsutas are coming and that as we all know is a Japanese sugar candy and they uh he, diabetes is very bad in his future that's why his that's why his pancreas, his pancreas is so, so ruined. The, candy, the candy is radio radioactive and so yeah that that must be what it was it was monsters but uh genius no, no. boy he, he says yeah he says he says something like you have to stop them and then he says mobsters so where where he came from the mob was running everything, and he was in the Japanese candy mines, mining candy for the mobsters, and he escaped through the portal. Yes. <laughs> it's the Mike, only logical Mike, explanation. Mike, we need to remind you, Mike maxed out the IQ test. And his aunts constantly <laughs> carry him related memories. Of huh. of similar things to what he's seeing and hearing. I think they did eventually figure out monsters. He like he ends the call to Reggie, like because he has to explain to Reggie, like, "Hey, <laughs> top man in the field here. Uh, yeah, we lost one. <laughs> he went what? through the portal. <laughs> <laughs> like, like he he went through the portal and uh, he came out uh, an aged, radiated mess. So." When's my ticket home? Yeah, like that's uh, that's he, what Mike says. He, uh, When's my ticket home? He uh, he didn't get on a plane before or after that happened. So I think the airlines are in the clear. Yes. So Mike assumes Reggie yeah, Mike, will be. Mike assumes checkmate. Like we're done here. Yes, <laughs> it's, it's dangerous. Not safe. Not safe. We just killed a guy. So. <laughs> oh, you forgot uh, to mention uh, the baseball that Bob had in his hand was nowhere to I'm, be found. I'm t yes, I was going to get back to that. I was telling it a little bit out of order. It makes more sense. So after Mike realizes that Reggie is not going to cancel the project, despite the fact that somebody has died now, and they know somebody died from going through the portal, they're not canceling it. When Mike comes back to, to the office the next day, everybody's working and they've, they've been working for some time. The engineers are going over the devices. They're taking the equipment apart, checking for faults. The programmers and and by programmers, I mean Jamie and Arthur going over the algorithm, trying to see if anything could be, could be different or if there's any bug in the code. And Mike realizes something's missing. The baseball. Where's the baseball? Good God. Did Bob have a baseball on him? He asks the autopsy doctor, did Bob have a baseball in him? <laughs> Where's the baseball? <laughs> <laughs> the mobsters shove that baseball up his ass before pushing him through the portal. So the baseball that they were tossing seems to have disappeared. And the engineers insist that there is no fault in the machinery and 
Jamie insists that there is no fault in the code. Now, Jamie has previously mentioned that there are 2 million lines of code in the program that runs the door. And I didn't mention that until this point because they seem to, I forget when exactly it happens, but Arthur describes the door as a sophisticated machine that beams like math into the universe and the universe answers the math or something. And I thought that was dumb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think his I think his line was we tell the universe, I don't care what you think. I'm taking my foot here and I'm putting it there. And they do that with complicated mathematics. And I figured that was just a way of explaining science that, you know, doesn't exist. So, like, yeah, it's just complicated math. We do stuff with the machine. The machine, you know, jiggles reality. Jiggles. So, the jiggle. <laughs> the jiggle. <laughs> which would have been my title for the book, which I'm surprised <laughs> Peter Kleins hasn't written. Well, we'll get to that. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So... Uh, and then Jamie confirms that it is indeed a very complicated piece of code because it is two million lines long. Now, since we have established that I am some sort of computer person, I will tell you lines of code is a terrible measurement of how complex or important something is. Now, I will, I will uh, have a slight disagreement with you there because as a layman who has no fucking clue about code or anything if you told me something was five million lines of code i would go well that's impressive and i would move on with my life so if maybe I if i told you something was five hundred thousand words long does that <laughs> tell you anything about what it is <laughs> if i told you we wrote what a, a hundred thousand word book Available would you assume we were now? Yeah. Would you assume we were good writers? Because <laughs> <laughs> that would be a mistake. No, it's it's a common thing though. Typically, just for your edification, uh, the same task done in fewer lines is more impressive. Code's two million lines long, which is a lot of code. Our book is three hundred and six pages long. Pretty impressive. All right. Jamie is going to attempt to go through 2 million lines of code and check for error. So while she's going through this, Mike wants to look at the cameras to see if he can see something. And Jamie gets very defensive and says, well, what, you think there's something I, I didn't notice? And, yes, you know, he's, he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm ant brain. Yes, I do. I, I notice things you don't. That's like... <laughs> It's what I do, <laughs> you know, it's, it's my whole character. She, she reluctantly agrees to let him look at the cameras and he leans over and, and just brushes her shoulder and she jumps out of the chair and she's like, don't you ever fucking touch me. I think that might be the actual line. <laughs> I think that is correct. And she storms out. She's obviously upset because her friend died and she feels responsible. And Arthur apologizes, and he's, he's like, I guess nobody told you about Jamie's uh, personal space issues. And we find out later that Jamie invites Mike out for a drink by way of apology. And when he gets to the bar, she's already pretty deep in the cups. And she does buy him a drink, and she tells him her drunken story of how she came to have these scars <laughs> okay joker so <laughs> here i got these scars we find out that jamie is actually she was in a pretty bad motorcycle accident when she was a kid the driver of the motorcycle died she was actually on the back she skid she crashed it going like 100 miles an hour or something and she was skidded on her back for many many yards and it it destroyed, destroyed all of her nerves, is what it said. Destroyed the nerves in her back, the nerve endings in her back, and took off a good layer of skin. And she had several skin grafts that didn't quite take, 
And so her back is just a mess of scars and she has a lot of trauma associated with that. It's apparently been the cause of, or at least to her, she blames it for many failed relationships, claiming that she's, she's monstrous. She's not attractive. Yeah, let me, let me read this for you because as I'm looking at this book, I, I chuckled when I saw my note. <clears throat> she says, I just don't like being reminded that I'm disfigured. And then Mike says, I'd hardly say that. If you don't mind me saying it, you're one of the most beautiful women I've ever met. And I, I read my comment because I noticed I put, it, put one there and it said, are you for fucking real? Did you turn British there for a second? I did. I did. Are you having a go at me? <laughs> I, it was at that moment I knew she's the love interest. I was afraid of this, yeah. I was like, she has done nothing but spit on Mike and call him a piece of shit, but now that so, she's now that she is twenty drinks deep or whatever suddenly this good person comes out who's really attracted to ant brain. I was afraid of this as soon as I realized that Mike was very similar to Nate and Jamie was an attractive hacker. Yep. An important thing to know about 14, if you haven't read 14, is that the love interest is an attractive hacker girl. And I think Peter Kleins may have something of a type. You can tell me, in any of his other books, does the protagonist, who is a 30-something slacker, fall in love with a much more intelligent, attractive hacker? Well, obviously not in this case. Nobody's more intelligent. No, no but. one could possibly be more intelligent than Antbrain. Well, I only read the first of the X-Heroes series, which was okay, but I have no, no desire to read any of the other books in that series. And yeah. the stand-in for Superman is like an everyman, and he's really attracted to the stand-in for Batman, who is a super intelligent woman, who is so hot that she hides her appearance at all times and no one knows what she looks like. Oh, boy. So, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, getting, we're, we're getting near it. <laughs> they, they have a, a makeup session, and of course... You know, good old Mike, never worry about him hitting on a grieving woman. <laughs> 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 Who yeah. has shown absolutely no interest in any kind of relationship with him up until this point. Yeah, I was really, I was genuinely hoping that this was just Jamie coming around, trying to make amends and her realizing like i was hoping what was going to happen was that jamie would become an ally and that she would realize that you know what we're doing here the the secrecy or whatever we're after it's not worth human life and i'm going to help mike i'm going to tell him what's actually going on i knew immediately that this was they're going to hook up i did too unfortunately peter Kleins has an interesting habit of describing women by level of attractiveness, hair color, and race. That Don't forget their bust size. Yeah, that too. Uh, he, he does sometimes do it with men. So I, I couldn't really put my finger on anything that I thought was overtly like sexist or misogynist, but there is an uncomfortable pattern that starts to develop, and we are going to talk about that. The next day, they're in the lab again and mike walks in just in time to see that they're getting ready for another crosswalk and mike goes into full panic he's like you you guys cannot be serious somebody literally died yesterday of all the cancer in a puncture wound yeah like you you cannot seriously be considering that and they're they insist and i'm dead serious they insist it was a fluke <laughs> This is what I mean about that denial. They're like, no, it's got to work. That was, that was a one-time thing. It's like and there, was a, there was a thing where Reggie pointed out, he did the math, and it's something like 2% of all the crosswalks have ended in somebody being dead or, dis or maimed psychologically. Is and that an acceptable failure rate? 
No, he said, imagine that's, that's the equivalent of like 30 jumbo jets falling out of the air every day. <laughs> yeah. Like to, to go back to fucking air travel as an allegory. No, it's not an acceptable. Rate. <laughs> like, <laughs> if, if you have like a 2% casualty rate, <laughs> no, that's awful. Like if every hundred car trips, two of them crashed, no. Right. <laughs> not just not just crashed, but horribly maimed and Yeah, so <laughs> they're firing it up again. They're going to go through. And guess who's going through? Jamie. She needs to prove to herself. And I think what's going on here is basically by extension, the rest of them also need to prove to themselves that they're not responsible for Bob's death. And they absolutely are. One hundred percent. Fluke or no fluke, it doesn't matter. You are responsible. I'm shocked no one said he knew the risks. <laughs> Move on. So Jamie walks through despite Mike's many attempts to stop the walk. And she appears to be okay. In fact, she's she appears to happy. be more than okay. What she's very happy and, and bubbly and they all chalk it up to her being relieved that the that the uh, Albuquerque door still works. But I think when we come back in part two, we're going to find out that there might be something a little more going on with Jamie's improved mood. And libido. <laughs> on words about books, we're going to talk about Peter Klein's problematic love interests. <laughs> yeah. That's a good way of putting it. Can I give you one one small preview? Oh yeah. Of of Peter Klein's uh many many problems. Yeah, give him something to come back for. Yeah. So, oh, let me see where this is. So, this is how Peter Klein's from the perspective of her male teacher describes an underage girl. He was left with an image of a mousy, flat-chested girl with wire-rimmed glasses. And I have that sentence highlighted. And that's, that note reads, that's a weird thing for a teacher to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a bit. I don't think I'd want my, my daughter's high school English teacher uh, referring to her as flat-chested. <laughs> no. No, I would um, never want that. No, that's... um. That, that's weird. So, yeah, when we come back, we'll talk about Jamie, the love interest. Oh, yes. If you thought that boardroom was bad, stay tuned. You're... Oh, God. Did you read the afterword? I did, but I didn't highlight any of it. Oh, I highlighted a part of it. Finally, many, many thanks, as always, to my lovely lady, Colleen. He my ladied her. <laughs> <laughs> that's a tip of the fedora from peter klein's all right well that'll, that'll be <laughs> next time um so if you haven't read the fold yet and uh we'll just go read 14 oh. instead don't yeah, read the fold read... go read 14 <laughs> 14 if you is... read the fold you're probably keeping up with our podcast <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> um you know, this is another bizarre thing, though, like of like my theory that book ratings are, are fucked because it's such a time commitment that nobody reads a book they don't like. Like this book has four stars on Goodreads. Yeah, I saw that. I was like, you got to be fucking kidding me. But I, it's that thing where it's like nobody who didn't like the book finished it to go to Goodreads. Like, yeah. And do you want to plug the next book? after we're done with the fold so they can get a jump start on that so next time on words about books we will be covering chapters 26 through 52 of the fold by peter kleins and in advance notice for next month we'll be reading a graphic novel boop, 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 boop. hey everyone this is nate and we originally planned on reading a graphic novel called Welcome Back. We found we had a difficult time discussing a graphic novel because so much of it is tied in with the art. And it's just our current format doesn't really accommodate it. So we're putting that on the shelf. 
as for what we're going to read next, Ben and I had a selection process. I gave him a list of books, and he had to pick one of those books. And this podcast is already going pretty long, so I'm going to release it as a standalone. So look forward to that. Probably be out before the fold part two. Probably be out next week. Thanks for listening. Next time <laughs> on Words with Books, we're going to talk about Peter Klein's many problems with women. Words with books? <laughs> oh, shit. That's the other podcast I do. That's the other podcast.